Good evening and thank you for joining us on the hot seat. Tonight we have a conversation with the CS Devolution, Eugene Wamalwa, and he, I believe he has a lot to share with us. How are you, Waziri? I'm all right, thanks. How is it going? No, quite okay. In spite of the COVID-19, of course, yeah. it's, uh, it's been a bit tough on all of us. Yes. But you're managing? Yes, yes, yes. We are Politically? Right. Yeah, I think it's a bit turbulent. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, as you know, we are... We are a few weeks to an election year. Uh, from August, we'll be entering an election year. So we, we expect uh, turbulence. Okay. Yes. And from your ministry, yes. how is it? No, no, we're okay. We're managing well. Yes. How are counties? I know this is the week we're having budget reading. Yes. Um, how are counties expecting or your ministry? Yes. No, counties are doing well. Um, of course, they have a heavy burden with this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis, health being a devolved uh, function. So a lot is uh, on their shoulders. Now. Uh, but we are happy uh, from March last year up to now, we made a lot of progress. Uh, almost all the counties now have uh, met the threshold of 300 beds. Uh, they are supposed to create isolation centers. They've, they've done well. Okay. So it's a crisis, but it's also been an opportunity to improve uh, the uh, equipping of our hospitals and uh, health services generally in the country have improved. All right. This uh, is good to hear from the CS. Yes. That means it's, an, uh, it's a confirmation indeed counties are working. Correct. All Devolution right. is working. Fantastic. Yes. So before we go to the nitty gritties of uh, devolution, let's just get to share part of your story. Who is Eugene? How yes. was your growing up? Yes. Where did you grow up? Yes, yeah. I grew up on a farm. I was born uh, uh, in Kitale, uh, at the foot of Mount Elgon. Uh, and we grew up on the farm. Uh, we were a big family. Uh, my father had uh, five wives. Wow. And uh, we were like 22 uh, siblings. Do you know each uh, other? Yes, Everyone. Of course. <laughs> uh, we were like, uh, you know, a whole football team. And Plus. a whole net, netball <laughs> team of girls. So we, it was a very nice uh, upbringing out there on the farm. And uh, uh, with our five mothers, uh, we were very, very close. But uh, he died quite young in 1976 when we were still very uh, small. And uh, we were basically raised by our late brother, uh, Michael. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, he was the firstborn, so he took the responsibility of uh, raising us all, putting us through school to college. Yes, it, it was uh, quite an interesting uh, place to grow. Okay, how was uh, schooling like as a young child among many children? Yes. Our, our father was a very uh, down to earth man, and uh, uh, in spite of him having been. Uh, a senator, uh, the first senator in that area. He wanted his kids brought up like all the other kids uh, and would go to school with the, the sons of uh, the milkman, the watchman, the herdsman, and uh, there was uh, no special treatment. So we went to the local primary school and uh, it was part of his donation to the community at uh, our Three Rivers farm. So uh, we started Three Rivers Primary. That's where we all went. And they said, you have to work hard and uh, ensure you succeed in school. Uh, though he was a wealthy man, he said, this is mine. You must go and make your own money. So he, he was uh, quite a disciplinarian. And he pushed us hard to succeed in life. Okay. And so did our brother when uh, he took over. Uh, there was no special treatment. We, we, we grew up like all the other uh, kids on the farm. All right. Yes. So now from the farm to where did you go to high school? How was yes. high school life? Yes. From uh, uh, Three Rivers Primary, uh, I went to Kitale Union uh, Primary after uh, my father died. Uh, and I was uh, raised by an uncle, mm -hmm. Joram Sambasi, who passed away recently. Uh, God rest his soul in peace. And uh, after there, I was able to join uh, Kipsangui uh, Secondary School, that's in Wasingishu County. That's where I went for my Form 1. Uh, but my late brother went to Chawet, it's uh, mm -hmm. one of uh, the top schools in West Pokot County. 
And uh, he really insisted that uh, he wanted us uh, all to go through that school. So most of my brothers and I went through Chewet. So from his experience, he yes, had he liked to pass Chewet, it on. So uh, he took me there. And that is where I did my uh, fourth form. And uh, from there, I went to uh, Genbi High School in uh, South Nyanza, that's in Kindu Bay. And uh, I managed to uh, emerge as a top student uh, that year. And I joined the University of Nairobi as uh, a law student. The university. The university. <laughs> they uh, have to. Everyone who goes there has to say I like the emphasis because I had my sister Eunice in KU. I had my brother Situ in Egerton. But I used to tell them uh, that is Kenyatta University, Egerton University. But, but this is the university wow. of Nairobi. <laughs> Why is it that everyone who went to UON always has to insist? I mean, the rest it, of us. Because really, it, it, it is... Uh, uh, one of the best universities. We used to boast uh, 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 north of the Limpopo and south of the Sahara. <laughs> it, it still remains uh, the, one of the, the top best. universities yes. in Africa as we speak. They're uh, competing with uh, a few universities in the south and in Cairo, but uh, in East Africa and in Africa generally, the University of Nairobi still remains uh, the top uh, university in Africa. Proud. So I'm, I'm proud of it. <laughs> and uh, I, I went back after I graduated. Uh, <laughs> My LLB, I went back for my master's. So before you went back yes. there, um, because now you joined politics way later in life. When you're in campus, yes. was it a thing you were involved in or were you just in, uh, watching? Politics? Yeah. No, no, no. I, was, uh, I had a passion for the law. And uh, after I completed my uh, first degree, I uh, went to practice. Uh, I started off with uh, James Orengo. Uh, he's really the one who tutored me. Senior uh, council. Yes, senior council, uh, and now senator for Siaya County. And he was my brother's best friend. Oh. After that, I went to uh, Nancy Barazzo's chambers. And she was really like my uh, uh, professional mother. She was the one who raised me professionally. And there were about six sisters. Uh, we had Nancy Barraza, we had uh, Lucy Kambuni, we had uh, Gidai, we had uh, the... Uh, CJ now, Martha Kome, uh, and uh, Martha Karua. They, they were like six oh. sisters. Uh, and were very, very close. Uh, and there was one, Betty Rashid, uh, who passed away. So really, they were like my professional mothers as I joined uh, practice. Uh, were very close with them and Nancy. So you learned from the best. The best. And uh, I've had the privilege of knowing the best of uh, legal brains in this country. And uh, I thank God for that. How would you describe working under these six um, power women, so to say? Mm. I think it was a humbling experience because these are uh, uh, highly professional women, uh, women of substance and uh, outstanding in their contributions to uh, our jurisprudence as well as our uh, legislation. Uh, like Martha in Parliament uh, was a real top performer. Uh, then after that, uh, she, we, as Minister for Justice and Constitutional Affairs, she was one of the best. And I was very happy uh, to follow in her footsteps to join the Ministry of uh, Justice and Constitutional Affairs. Then later on, she moved to water. And coincidentally, again, you I followed. followed her to water. So I, was, I, I met her once and she was joking uh, about how I've been uh, uh, like her son following her footsteps. But uh. professionally, uh, um, I was blessed to have had... Uh, uh, my six uh, professional mothers, all outstanding women. I'm very, very yeah. proud uh, to have known them. So, and from this, uh, working with these outstanding women, what are the best life lessons that you took from them? I think it's about uh, hard work uh, from where they came from. I, I knew them when they didn't have much, uh, when they were driving uh, very ordinary cars, struggling. Uh, and uh, they worked hard to make a mark in the profession as well as in the country. Uh, just looking at uh, 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 Justice Martha Kome being sworn in at CJ the other day was really an amazing day mm -hmm. to celebrate uh, the girl child in this country and to have uh, uh, an, an old gas team leading uh, a critical arm of government, you know, from uh, Martha Kome to, uh, to Mwilu, uh, her deputy, uh, down to the uh, registrar, uh, 
Amadi, all top professionals and uh, leading uh, uh, an arm of government. I'm, I'm very, very proud. Nancy, having been the first uh, DCJ, uh, she, she broke the glass ceiling. Yeah. Then, uh, of course, Rawal came in. Then uh, uh, Mwilu is in now. Uh, and uh, with uh, Martha Komi on top, we, we, we're very proud. Oh, and I'm very proud to have known them in their days when they were still young and uh, hardworking. And there's no shortcut to success. This is what I want to tell all the young girls and uh, all the young Kenyans coming up. There's no substitution for hard work. All these top people worked hard to get to where they did. You inclusive, of course. Yes, I, I mean, you're uh, the CS. We I, can't I, leave that I, out. I, I, I think I'm, uh, I'm proud to have come from a stock of hard workers. Oh, and, great. Uh, men and women of integrity who have given their all uh, to this country. Ah, amazing. Yes. So from a very high-flying uh, career in law, yes. then uh, suddenly your brother passes on and you end up in politics. Was it a thing you always wanted to do or were you forced? Or was it a thing you thought because my brother was out there, then why not? Because Michael set up a very good uh, presidency in politics. Yes. In, in, in politics, I would say we were very well represented as a family. And uh, Mike was one of the best politicians I've ever met and a statesman. Uh, we had really uh, dreamed of him being uh, president of Kenya. I think but, uh, we he all did. Heartbeat, it was just a heartbeat away when we lost him. Yeah. It was so tragic. And uh, I was just a young lawyer, uh, fresh from uh, uh, winning a big case in Uganda where I was the representing uh, President Seveni with uh, Dr. John Haminua. So it was a shock to me when uh, he went down and we lost him. And uh, I'd been out to London with him for several months uh, as he was recuperating. Then uh, we came back with him, uh, with his body. Uh, after that, things moved very fast. And uh, elders came uh, from my uh, community and said, we don't see anyone else uh, fit to take uh, your brother's mantle but you. And I left my very organized life as a lawyer, I was doing well, uh, then went into the turbulent uh, sea of politics. And my life has never been the same again. How was that transition? I mean, lawyers are yes. this polished, uh, yes. well, cool, calm, collected. Yes. Then, boom, to the ocean of politics where people don't say what they mean or say what they don't mean. Correct, yeah. correct. It, it was like being uh, thrown, uh, you know, uh, at the deep end of the pool. Uh, I was totally unprepared. I was very naive politically, and uh, I thought my brother's friends were my friends. That was a big mistake. <laughs> so going into that <laughs> uh, by-election, I, I realized there were some of uh, uh, my brother's uh, very close allies uh, who had maybe felt he had really dominated uh, the uh, political space, both uh, in the Western region as a leader and nationally. And they wanted to, you know, come down, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, have their time. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought they would, their support would be automatic, but it turned out not to be. Uh, I was uh, uh, run out of town uh, during that by election. I lost. Uh, then I learned my lessons. How was the feeling? I mean, you've come from a very high profile uh, yes. career as a law. Yes. Then you go to politics where you imagine because your brother was a top leader and mm -hmm. guys loved him, then they will yes. do the same to you, but yes. you lose. How was that for you? Like, at that moment, did you think of going back to law? Yes, uh, I mean, once a lawyer, always a lawyer. I, I still uh, continued with my practice, but it was a humbling lesson. Uh, and I've heard of uh, people talk about dynasties and uh, trying to refer to me as one of them. Uh, yet, it, yet if I was, uh, I should just have automatically inherited my brother's seat, but I did not. The people uh, said you must be your own man and uh, we'll vote for you uh, based on your own record. So I had to, it was a humbling experience, I had to go back to the people, go back to the villages work with the communities, the women, the border border, the youth, the churches. By the time we're going uh, back to the two or seven elections, I had made my own uh, mark, my own connections. And uh, those who have thought I, I, I wrote on my brother's name, or, or, I, uh, or, or uh, uh, 
I am because my brother was. I think uh, they do not know me. They do not know the journey I've traveled and uh, the uh, entry, the difficult entry into politics that I experienced. But working with the people, I think I want to encourage any leader who wishes to serve the people that you must go down and do what Jesus said. Uh, he who wants to be the leader must be ready to wash the feet of his uh, disciples and uh, nurse their wounds. You must be able to do that. Go down to the village, to that local man and woman, and be ready to serve. And they will reward you with the position uh, that you wish to serve them. I'm very privileged to have been a member of parliament for Saboti and uh, very grateful that uh, I've been able to serve uh, in cabinet, now in three uh, senior ministries. Yes. Uh, so I, I thank God that uh, I have been able to serve in all the three arms of, uh, of government. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been uh, a lawyer and uh, a lawmaker, and now uh, I'm executing the law in the executive. I'm, I'm very, very uh, privileged to have Which had Which not many people manage to get that together. I think it's a in real that opportunity. Lifetime. I'm privileged. I'm uh, very grateful to God uh, at my age to have been able to get the opportunity to serve Kenyans in different capacities uh, and in, the, in all the three arms of government. I'm, yeah. I'm very, very grateful uh, to God and uh, also grateful to uh, President Kibaki uh, who gave me the opportunity to serve in his administration at a critical stage uh, in the history of our country. We've just promulgated the new constitution. Yes. And uh, now uh, the harder part was implementing that constitution. And I was able to work very closely with uh, Charles Nechai and uh, his team, uh, Commission for Implementation of the Constitution, work with the uh, other colleagues in parliament, the parliamentary committee on uh, uh, impl Im implementation of the constitution, the oversight committee. We, we worked very hard with uh, Professor Gidu Muigai as Attorney General to implement this constitution that uh, we are now enjoying. All right. And uh, I'm also very grateful to uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta for giving me the opportunity to serve in the Ministry of Water uh, and now currently in the Ministry of Devolution. So you've worked at the Ministry of uh, Constitutional Affairs, yes. then Water, and now Devolution. Now devolution yes. Out of the three, which was the hardest and why? I think the hardest was uh, uh, the Ministry of uh, Justice because we were at a very uh, critical stage of uh, our journey, having just gotten a new constitution and uh, we're now preparing uh, to have the first election under the new constitution. That's in 2013 now. Yes, it was, uh, it, it was uh, a very uh, tricky time. It was a very tricky time. What was the, Many what people would you might say not was the hardest? Uh, the <laughs> amount of work that went into uh, the preparation for that election, because the IEBC was, uh, was uh, uh, under my ministry, and uh, we had to work very closely uh, with, uh, uh, I think then, uh, before Chebukati, we had uh, Isaac Hassan, Isaac Hassan uh, who was my classmate at uh, the university. I was very privileged to work with him and his team, to work with President Kibaki and uh, Prime Minister Raila Odinga to ensure that election was held. A lot of work went into it in uh, preparing the IBC and also preparing the country for a peaceful election. It was not easy. Yes. All right. Ministry of Water, how would you rate your performance? The Ministry of Water, I'm very proud of uh, uh, my record. We were able to do quite a lot. And I'm very happy that uh, even as uh, I serve in devolution, uh, the president has also given me the docket of uh, uh, the State Department of Assam. So I'm still working with the same counties that uh, had uh, serious uh, water problems, water challenges, uh, especially in the face of climate change. Uh, again, the hardest hit counties uh, are, are the Asal counties. When you're talking of drought, these are the hardest hit counties. When you're talking of floods, again, locust invasion, the Asal counties are the hardest hit. So I'm happy that having been in the Ministry of Water, uh, uh, we have continuity in terms of uh, 
working with these counties to build dams, to uh, build resilience of uh, these counties. And uh, most of the projects that we started, I am happy, uh, are going on very well. We started Fuake Dam in Ukambani, cutting across Kitui and uh, Makueni all the way to Konza. Uh, that project is ongoing. It's a game changer. It's the largest dam that we're building in Kenya today. And we thank the African uh, Development Bank for the support. Once we are done with Tuake Dam, and it's, I'm told it's almost uh, 40 to 50 percent done, we'll be able to turn Okambani into a new breadbasket of Kenya. We'll have over 100,000 acres under irrigation. And uh, instead of taking relief food to Okambani, or what they used to call Molio, we will be getting food from Okambani to the other counties. I'm very proud of that. In uh, Kirinyaga, we started a paper dam. It's going to be a game changer in terms of uh, boosting our food security. We are going to more than double rice production in this country just by uh, allowing uh, uh, more irrigation by gravity in Mwea. We are very happy that in Bunyala, uh, we also have uh, uh, the Loanzuya project that uh, we started while I was uh, at the ministry. This is going to tame the floods of River Nzuya. So the perennial floods that you hear about in uh, Budalangi, once the permanent dikes are built and we double the rice production in Bunyala, we will be able to uh, transform that region. Lastly, in Kisumu County, the perennial Nyando floods, we had uh, uh, started uh, getting Soin Koro Dam uh, built. And I'm very happy that as we speak, my sister Cicely Karaoke is in the process of getting that dam constructed. You will never hear of floods in Nyando again once we tame the river, the waters of River Nyando, because as it rains in uh, Kericho, all this water comes down to the lake. But once we have that dam, we'll be able to hold the water, we'll be able to have uh, hydropower, we'll be able to irrigate and actually double rice production in uh, Kano, West Kano. Uh, uh, Ahero uh, areas. Right. So I'm, I'm very happy that uh, these successes, uh, uh, when eventually uh, impact on our country, Your name uh, will be. my name will be associated with it. I'm very proud to have had an opportunity to make a contribution. And it was not all successful. Uh, one thing that uh, didn't succeed very well was uh, the Galana uh, irrigation project. Yes, because I was going to come to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had a promising um, launch, yes. and we actually saw the 10,000 acres yes. with uh, maize, but then again, uh, recently the, the, the company that was working, yes. they left. Mm -hmm. What's up with Galana? I think Galana, it was uh, the implementation. Uh, when I'm, I, I moved into the ministry, already uh, the, uh, the project was uh, stumbling and uh, we had to do quite a bit uh, in legal parlance we would say putting Humpty Dumpty back on the wall trying to restore the project and I must thank uh, uh, the Agriculture Committee of Parliament uh, we worked very closely uh, with them to uh, design a new roadmap towards completion of that Galana project, including cutting down, scaling down the project considerably from 14 billion to 7 billion, and getting uh, the model farm to work uh, on an agreed transitional uh, phase to uh, private sector. Once we have private sector coming in, they will be able to now do the production, uh, do business, and uh, our position was that it's not the business of government to do business. So I believe that uh, that project is viable. I still know that uh, uh, we were able to achieve the proof of concept that out there in uh, uh, you know, this land that had just bushes and snakes, we're able to produce the best maize, aflatoxin free maize to feed this country. So there are million acres lying out there can actually create a new basket, a uh, food basket, uh, basket for Kenya. And I'm happy that uh, my colleagues who took over have formed a team, a multi-agency team, that is now managing the transitioning uh, to uh, private sector management of that project. Once we do, I believe, one day we look back and say, Uhuru Kenyatta was never wrong. 
about uh, the Rana and the food security pillar. But someone else would argue that we've wasted, we, in 2013-14, the allocation was 4.5 <coughs> billion, 14-15, 3.5 billion, 15-16, yes. uh, 3.5, 16-17, I mean, there's just billions yes. that people, Kenyans feel went into waste. Not really, because when you go to Ghana now, and even those uh, who are opposed to the project, I, I saw the former Prime Minister, uh, Ray Lodinga, visit Ghana, and he was very surprised when he saw the quality of maize and uh, the production that was going on in Ghana, the equipment. Uh, he, he changed his mind about what he had always said, that this is a white elephant, and uh, he said the project is viable. What needs to be done now is to complete the transitioning so that private sector comes on board to do the production. A lot went into research. First of all, in terms of finding the suitable varieties of uh, maize to be grown in that area. That research is not lost because we have been able to prove that uh, in Galana, you can actually produce more maize per acre than in Transoya, the traditional food basket of Kenya. That is not lost. It's a benefit that will be passed on to Kenyans as we increase production in this area. Apart from that, we were also able to come up with uh, treatment for aflatoxin. So in the same area, uh, uh, Tana River County, we did something in Bura. We had an overproduction of uh, maize. But what happened? Aflatoxin came in, and we lost the whole crop. But out of the research done in Galana now, we have aflatoxin-free maize that can feed this country. If we're able to do their million acres, we will never need to import uh, food again in this country. So hopefully we do that without losing more billions into it. We, we, we don't have to once we have private sector coming on board. Because as government, ours was to provide the necessary infrastructure, to provide uh, the conducive environment, and uh, in terms of uh, what varieties uh, of uh, food that can actually be grown there. That we have done. So it's a benefit that we we'll pass on uh, to the private sector and the two counties. All we right. must involve both Kilifi County and Tana River County to be part of that production. We also want the youth to be part of that uh, production. And I think uh, we had already set uh, an arrangement for uh, the National Youth Service to come in and uh, to also encourage youth groups to go out there and know that uh, agriculture is also a way of earning a living in this country. That's true. Mm -hmm. Something else you had promised in an earlier interview way back, I think in 2016, was uh, to have dams in uh, Mandera, Trukana, yes. and have enough water yes. by 2020. Yes. But we're in 2021, and I don't think we have a dam in Mandera as per my research. Actually, what we've done, we've done three dams so far. There's a dam in uh, West Pocot, in a place called Cassess. We have a dam in Trukana. Uh, in a place called uh, Urum. If you go there, uh, you find these are peace dams that under uh, my ministry, uh, the president directed as part of the cross-border program to prevent conflict between uh, our border communities. Uh, instead of uh, our Trukano brothers and sisters crossing into Uganda, all the way to Kobebe where there's a dam, we build a dam on our side of the border, and that is what we are doing. If you go to West Pocot, we have a lot of uh, pastoralists from West Pocot. When there is drought, the pastoralists know only two things, water and pasture. They don't know anything about our artificial borders. So they cross into Uganda. There are conflicts between them and the Karamoja. So that's why I'm very proud that uh, so far as we speak, we have three dams that we have done in West Pocot, in Turkana, and in Masabi. There's a place called Forole. If you go there, uh, we've just completed that dam. And uh, I want to thank our uh, sister Ministry of Water for, the, for implementing this project. And very soon, we will be uh, inviting His Excellency, the President uh, of Kenya, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, and the uh, President Museveni of Uganda, as we mark the uh, Peace Accord of Morota in September. We want them to come and launch these dams so that we have uh, our pastoral list uh, getting water and avoiding conflict between them and the neighboring community. So September, so apart then from have the three, water. Yes, apart from the three, I've uh, mentioned uh, the other dams that are yes. uh, ongoing. Yes. Dams like 
Itare in Nakuru that uh, also faltered. Uh, so it's not that uh, it's, it was uh, all success. There are areas where we did do so well, and uh, that we acknowledge. Uh, we could have done better in Galana. Uh, it tied it down. Uh, that contractor let us down. Uh, they went. They, they became insolvent. So a very good project that would have brought water to almost a million residents of Nakuru stopped. But it's a viable project, and uh, I think a way will be found on how it can be completed so that we are able to serve that population of, of Nakuru. Nakuru is depending on Nyandarwa. Uh, so water uh, coming down uh, from Nyandarwa uh, is what is going to help Nakuru. But with the Itare, Nakuru itself will get water and also uh, the neighboring county of Kericho. All right. Yes. So I hopefully we'll get there soon. We, we will. I know it's, uh, we've had challenges with our dams. And uh, I think the government is addressing the issues. All right. Yes. So um, something else uh, before we come now to devolution. What's our percentage of water availability for the country at this point? Our target was once we complete these uh, dams, we should be able to shoot from 60 to 80 percent. Yes. As I uh, have said, most of the dams are ongoing, almost 50 percent. I believe uh, in another two years. If we are able to complete the dams that we have started, you will see uh, the coverage increase. Our target was uh, 80%. That was by then, 2020. Uh, by 2030, uh, we wanted to have achieved uh, uh, the 100% mark. Do you uh, think we still manage? Now we're in 2021. We still have yes. nine years. I believe if we uh, maintain our priorities, and we have honest Kenyans of integrity. And beat corruption. To work hard to deliver and not to enrich themselves. We will be able. We, we can still achieve uh, universal coverage. In nine years' time. By 2030. In nine years, we can do a lot. Let's look at devolution. This is the ninth year of devolution. Uh, by next year, we'll be looking back and saying, we never imagined this could be done in nine years. So in nine years with proper, with good leadership and patriotic Kenyans who are dedicated to serving the Kenyans and not enriching themselves, we can achieve our goals uh, in nine years. All right. Yes. Back to devolution. Mm -hmm. What do you feel are your achievements in the two, three years that you've served in that uh, ministry? First of all, I would say we have improved intergovernmental relations. This is really the... Uh, soul of devolution. Under Article 6 of our Constitution, the two levels of government are supposed to work together in uh, consultation, in cooperation, and uh, in collaboration. When devolution started, I think uh, in the first three or four years, we had challenges because uh, it was an adversarial kind of relationship between the national and the county governments. It was more confrontational instead of uh, uh, cooperation. So what we want to uh, look back and say uh, is that uh, the last three years, starting with uh, Chairman uh, Nanok, Governor for Turkana, who was the chair when I came in, uh, all the way to uh, Governor of Paranya, and now Governor Wambora, we have the best intergovernmental relations ever. This has uh, borne fruits for Kenyans in terms of improved uh, services, uh, improved response even when it comes to this COVID-19 crisis. Because of those improved relations, we were able to have almost four summit sessions. The summit is the apex uh, uh, organ of leadership uh, of the two levels of government coming together. So we're able to put our heads together to say that uh, we, the, 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 there are no people belonging to the national government or those belonging to the county governments. We are serving the same for 7 million Kenyans in our 47 counties. So we must work together. And that we have been able to achieve, and I'm very, very proud of that. I think the other issue we can also say we uh, have made progress in is getting the counties to work with each other yeah. uh, within uh, the regional economic blocks. Uh, this has seen uh, counties uh, in the north, frontier counties, uh, 10 FCDC counties coming together, and what they've been able to achieve is a lot. 
they realize that they are stronger together than working separately. They are able to also uh, become more attractive to investors, even in terms of uh, uh, strengthening partnership with their development partners. It's easier, say, for the EU to engage a bloc like the FCDC, bring together the 10 counties, than for them to go to each individual county. Yeah. And likewise, uh, uh, when you look at uh, the Lake Region Economic Bloc, bring together 14 counties, it, it, it becomes, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an engine of growth that uh, is going to spur our economic growth as a country. So I'm very proud of uh, what we have achieved together with the counties in terms of uh, working together and strengthening the uh, evolution of our country. The last issue is um, uh, uh, the partnership in realization of the Big Four agenda. When the president declared uh, the Big Four agenda, uh, we were able to go to Kakamega and have the fifth devolution conference and enter into an agreement with the counties that these are the top priorities for our country today. Every Kenyan would like to put food at the table. Every Kenyan would like to get affordable uh, health care. When their children are unwell, they should be able to access health services affordably. Every Kenyan would like to live in a good house. And every Kenyan, of course, would like their children to uh, get a job. And manufacturing is the way to go. So we were able to enter into this partnership. And uh, in spite of these being devolved functions, we have a pact with the governors that we must work together to be able to deliver to Kenyans. All right. that, 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 that could be one of the biggest uh, achievements of, uh, of this administration. Because devolution is really uh, going to be the uh, when you're talking about uh, the Uhuru Kenyatta legacy, I believe it lies in devolution and what we've been able to achieve in all of our seven counties. All right. So out of 10, how would you rate the performance of uh, the different counties? I think uh, <coughs> through some of the programs we're running, and we have the Kenya Devolution Support Program, uh, working with uh, the World Bank, we are able to now start assessing the counties in terms of performance. And when we started, uh, I think we had only 13 counties that uh, had qualified uh, in terms of performance, the parameters given, uh, in managing their finances uh, prudently, in uh, you know, uh, delivering services. Uh, but by now, as we speak, we have uh, uh, over 38 counties that have now qualified. Out of, 47. out of 47. So it's a huge progress. And you see, uh, in terms of capacity building, uh, over the years, each county growing. And uh, we're very proud as a ministry uh, uh, that coordinates this to sit back and see the performance of each county uh, improving every year. And some counties, I can say, uh, have performed uh, very well, that uh, they have even been given a credit rating. Uh, We've just uh, come up with uh, uh, an on-source revenue policy so that we also encourage counties to generate more revenue locally. So they, they, they don't just over-rely on the, on the national uh, treasury. That, I can tell you, there are counties that are performing very well. I went to a county like Kajado. I think when they started, uh, they were, uh, I think, uh, they were talking of about, about 500 million. Uh, also, uh, but over time they have grown. In they are more than triple their own source revenue that they are generating locally. Uh, this I can say uh, is encouraging. So we want to encourage competition. Uh, under KDSP we have 20 billion, and we have been rewarding those counties that are performing. This has encouraged other counties that who are dragging their feet to also step up and. Uh, we, we, we are happy to see this improvement. All right. So, and in the improvement, something else that Kenyans feel yes. is that also corruption was devolved. Yes. Is that true or not? Because, I mean, there are, you've said there are like 37. So, these, these other counties are, that are not part of this. Is yes. it because of corruption? I, I, I think the biggest challenge, uh, actually the biggest threat we are facing uh, uh, to devolution is corruption. These... Uh, has seen quite 
uh, a number of uh, governors uh, get arrested and uh, are facing charges as we speak. This has never happened. So the crackdown on corruption is real. And uh, the president has made it very clear that there are no sacred cows. Whoever is found to have engaged in corruption, whether you are in cabinet, whether you are in the county, you will be arrested. And that's why you have seen even CSS uh, get arrested and uh, facing charges, PSS, and uh, quite a number of governors. So there are no sacred cows. And uh, one way to ensure we succeed in the war against corruption is institutionalizing the fight. And uh, we want to ask our politicians not to ethnicize uh, corruption. Because when you start defending, uh, your people say, you know, uh, my people are being targeted. Then you weaken uh, the institutions that are supposed to uh, effectively deliver on the agenda. So the way to go is to strengthen these institutions. And as we speak, when you look at the DPP, when you look at uh, 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 the DCI, these are institutions that have been empowered, they have been strengthened uh, in terms of funding, in terms of training, in terms of equipment. And we're seeing uh, the, the, the results. Yes. All right. And uh, in line with the devolution as a whole, with the biggest uh, population being the youth, yes. what's the value of devolution to the young people in this country? I think the young people uh, have to be at the center of the devolution agenda. And when I took over this ministry, I think the first thing I did was to include the youth in the devolution conference. I think this was the first time this was done in uh, Kakamega when we did the fifth devolution conference. We had youth come from every county and we sponsored about 300 youth to Kakamega. And uh, uh, we want to keep encouraging uh, our counties to put the youth at the center. We also uh, uh, have to uh, see how to empower the youth so that the money going to the counties reach to their pockets. Uh, through the 30% uh, uh, you know, uh, procurement. These we are seeing some of the counties doing very, very well, but there are those that are not doing well. So it's one of the areas we are looking at how we can strengthen uh, the youth factor so that we have more uh, money uh, getting into the hands of the youth. Okay. And um, of course, as someone who comes from Western Kenya, Something that's a thorn to the people of Western Kenya, which if I don't ask, they will judge yeah, me, yeah. is sugar. Yeah. Why have we killed our own? I don't think we have killed the, the, the industries out there. What we've had is an issue of uh, a, it's a governance issue. So we, we, when you look at the private millers, they are making profits. West Kenya, they are making profits. Butali, they're making profits. Why is it that Zoyan Mumias are not? Miwani, Mohoroni, Sony are not. Because it's, it's an attitude that uh, uh, we've had that, uh, you know, Mali ya Uma, Mali ya Uma. And uh, when we uh, uh, take money to these factories, and I know since President Uhuru Kenyatta took uh, over the leadership of this country, we have been with him to all these factories, pumping in billions. But somehow the money goes to the factories, but does not reach the farmers. Farmers are still not paid. Employees go for months without payment. So that's why the president formed the task force to look at what ails the sugar industry in this country. And uh, this was done in Kakamega uh, during Mashidari 2018. A task force formed, co-chaired by Governor uh, Oparanya and uh, CS Agriculture. That task force had a very wide consultative uh, process of engaging all stakeholders, and we were able to come up with recommendations, some of which included leasing of these factories to the private sector. Yes. And uh, when you hear of uh, uh, people like Devki getting interested in leasing, uh, it is in line with the recommendations that were made by this task force. So all I want to uh, urge our politicians to do is to uh, allow uh, that task force to deliver, uh, to avoid politicizing uh, uh, investment matters. Because in, in investors, 
don't like, you know, noise. In line with Politicians <laughs> with, uh, with an election coming, yeah. they feel like, you know, uh, uh, they need to make some necessary noise to seem to be championing the cause of farmers. Uh, but you also really want to say Makelele Yatura, as we but no one would want to take his money where the house is burning, people are fighting, you are not sure they are going to recover your investments, uh, and where you can't get a return on your investment. Why would you bother putting your five billion in an area like that? So what we need, and this I want to ask all leaders, uh, both in Western, Yamza, and the rest of the country, we need to create a conducive environment for investors to come in. There's no other way of reviving uh, this sugar sector. The government can no longer continue pumping money into uh, factories that are not recovering. The answer is to bring the private sector on board so that these companies can start making profits like the other private sector companies. They keep saying, yes. um, <coughs> even with investors wanting to come in, the issue of kickbacks is what is causing them to run away. Corruption. And worse still, that yeah. means more young people do not have jobs. That is correct. So what do we do to deal with this whole issue? What we should do is uh, to depoliticize the process. And uh, uh, once we do that, the people in Western, the poverty levels are very worrying. What the people want, they're hardworking people. They want to deliver their can to a factory that will pay them. They want the factory to work so that their children get jobs. In fact, if that was done, you would not hear all this noise. But like you say, there are vested interests in all this. There are cartels that are actually trying to prevent uh, reforms in the sugar sector, in the tea sector, in the coffee shop sector. You can see resistance everywhere. In all the reforms that the government is bringing, there are cases and cases trying to block the reforms. Because cartels would like the status quo to remain. This does not uh, exclude the sugar sector. And that is why we need to uh, think outside the box and see how to manage this process. So this issue of cartels and corruption, yes. I mean, we've sung about it as long as I have remembered. I'm young enough, but growing up, it's been a thing. Yes. Uh, I am now old enough to know what it means to have corruption and the impact. Yes. What's the way forward as leaders of this country? We, we don't have to be bold and bite the bullet and get these reforms through. Because nothing is going to change unless we change it. And that is why uh, the president has been very determined uh, to ensure that uh, we dismantle these cartels, uh, whether uh, it's in the dairy or the sugar or the tea or the coffee sector, we must dismantle the cartels. And this comes through uh, uh, strengthening the policy and legal framework as well as the institutions that manage this so that uh, we are able to uh, uh, do away with these cartels. And I think we are going to succeed. We will succeed. We will succeed. There is hope. There is hope. And uh, uh, all we need to do is to manage our politics. All right. That, that is the weakest link. Okay. Yes. Anyway, I hope we will manage that. But before we conclude, one more thing. Uh, 2022 is coming, and we've seen all these um, organizations of uh, groups, oh, Western Bloc, Eastern, uh, Correlations, and the likes. What's next for you? For me now, uh, I have uh, a contract I've been given uh, by President Uhuru Kenyatta. Which is about to end. Uh, 2022. <laughs> yes. Uh, to uh, complete. Yes. And the ones I uh, complete that, uh, we'll cross that change a little bridge when we get there. So we are not seeing you at the ballots, either at the top seat or at the governor's level? Or for, for now, I have a job to do, and I have my hands full. We are preparing for the devolution conference that's coming up in a few weeks. We are preparing for Africa cities. We are hosting the entire African continent in Kisumu. We are also uh, uh, fighting COVID-19. We still have the locust invasion, a third wave coming. Uh, we, 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 my hands are full. Uh, I don't think I even have time to think about next year. All right. But when we get there, we'll cross the bridge when we get there. All right. Final message to our viewers as the CS for devolution. 
Uh, and a leader true. from Western Kenya too, sorry. Mine is to tell Kenyans that uh, uh, our 2010 constitution gave us a great gift. And the greatest gift, I believe, of that constitution was the devolution. I believe if you go to any corner of this country, you will realize that devolution is working. And devolution has ended marginalization. There were parts of this country that had been left behind. And because of devolution, we have a more equitable Kenya. We have a more inclusive Kenya. And we have a more just Kenya. I believe we need to work together to strengthen devolution now and in future. We do not know what the Court of Appeal will decide on the BBI uh, uh, initiative. But I do believe if we succeed in that, therein lies the greatest chance of strengthening the evolution, getting more resources down to our counties so that every corner of Kenya, down to the world, is able to develop equitably and there's inclusive growth and prosperity in our country. So I'm very, very happy with the progress we're making so far and I would urge Kenyans to work together. We have an election coming, but let us remember there will be Kenya after this election. Let us not divide our country, let us not burn our country, let us have a Kenya after the next election that we still be proud of. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sana Waziru. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much. All right, we thank you so much for joining us on the show. Of course, remember, this is the hot seat. I hope you picked a thing or two from the CS. I'll see you next Sunday. My name is Sarah Mwangi. Have a good night.